Well, when I heard the news about what transpired on the UT campus today, I'll tell you, it, it served to strengthen my conviction about what we're talking about tonight. And what we're talking about tonight are the words of God. How do we know that we have the thoughts and the expressions of God? But before we get into the how, how do we know we have the words of God? Let me say this, we need to hear from God. We need the words of God. Today, the University of Texas was held hostage by a young man with a gun. And college students like you, an hour and a half away, were locked in classrooms and trying to find out what was going on and praying that the crisis would pass. And, and when you're faced with life and death situations like that, it raises questions. It brings up, how could this happen? What's going on here? And there's a certain base level of questions people can answer or answers people can give. They can say, well, he's mentally unstable and had a gun. And you go, okay, that may be true. And that's one level of answers. But life and death situations like this bring up deeper questions of, well, what's going on here? And is there meaning to all this? And is that all this world is? Are we just random molecules bouncing around that at any moment can be tyrannized by the whims of violent and unstable men? Or is there meaning to all this? Is there purpose to all this? And we begin to search for meaning. I remember when I was in high school, one of my good friends committed suicide my sophomore year. And I tell you that next week, our little Bible study quadrupled. And that living room was filled with the school drug dealer and people who were skeptical or outright hostile towards religion, but they came piling into this living room because in the midst of crisis, they wanted answers. And some skeptics might say, well, they were just looking for comfort. But the reality is, it's more than that. Because I've been to funerals where people just try to comfort each other by saying random platitudes that just come to the top of their head. Oh, they'll live in your memory. And they just kind of say things they're pulling out of nowhere. And I got to tell you something, they don't give me comfort. You're just making that up. That's the conjecture of some guy. I want real objective answers. And so they came saying, I don't want subjective comfort. I want objective truth. What's going on here? Where did we come from? What's wrong with us and how's it dealt with? And where's all this going? And so we look for subjective answers. And the reality is we need a God to tell us that. And some people might say, well, you know what, Ben, you have these existential longings. And so you've created a God in order to answer the questions of your longing. But the people who talk like that have one problem. And that is they say, that's the explanation of God. Your longing created God. Their only problem is they can't explain where the longing comes from. And everyone who talks like this says, oh, yes, that longing is just part of passing on your DNA. Evolution. All right. And uh, the reality is just screaming evolution into the void of that philosophical question is not sufficient. But the reality is this, that that longing for us, that longing for truth, it exists. We long for truth because there's such a thing as truth and we're meant to know it. We long for answers because there's such a thing as answers and we were meant to know them. We long for the transcendent because he exists and we are made to know him. And so ducks long for water and there's such a thing as water and babies long for milk and they're designed to take in milk and we long for God because we were made to move in God and drink deep from God. We were made to know him. And pain serves to jostle us out of the mundane and remind us that these big questions are stirring in us and they need answers. And the good news is this, the God who is communicates with us. He has talked to us. He lets us know. Because the reality is, and I don't need to preach this, you know this, we are communicative creatures, right? We like to talk to each other. Facebook has over 500 million users, all right? Twitter, and I know you don't Twitter, your generation's not Twitters, but Twitter, as of February, was posting 50 million tweets per day. That's around 600 tweets per second last time they ca uh, counted, all right? We love to communicate with each other. We're doing it all day long, just telling people what we're doing. Going to class now, eating peanuts now, going to the store, all right? We tell people everything, and we want to tell people this, and we want people to hear ba back, and we want to hear what people are up to. What's he up to? Where did he go? Where did you go? Who were you with? Do you like them more than me? What's going on? All right, we ask questions. We want to know. We want answers. We are a communicative bunch. And the reality is that's not random. We look like our dad in this. 
We were made in the image of God, and we long to communicate because we have a God, and he communicates. It's a basic tenet of Christianity that we believe a God created all this, and he is powerful enough to create, and thus powerful enough to communicate if he longs to. And he's also loving enough that he wants to. And so we have a God who is powerful and loving and makes himself known, and we can't know him unless he does. And yet he has chosen to give us a window into his heart, and he's done it through nature. We know it through creation. Psalm 19 says the heavens declare the glory of God. Romans 1 say his invisible attributes are made known through what he has made. There were times in history, prophets record, where he spoke audibly to people, but most often the way we get to the words of God, he tells us he's given them to us in his word. The gospel and the Bible will say that what we have in our Bible is not theology. Theology are man's thoughts about what God might be like. What our Bible will say of itself is that what we have here is not theology, the thoughts of man about what God may be like. What we have here is revelation, that God has come to tell us what he is like. And if you struggle with that idea of a transcendent God who's loving enough to communicate with us, I would just challenge you, you need to question what presuppositions you're bringing to this conversation that make you think that's unrealistic. And we're not going to get into all that. I would just challenge you to think about that. Why do you think that's crazy? Think about it. What have you brought to the conversation that makes you think that a powerful and transcendent deity wouldn't communicate with us? He has. He does. And so we can know his thoughts. And what's interesting about this moment in Thessalonians is Paul is writing to the Thessalonians and he's thanking God again. And he says, I thank God constantly for this, that when you heard the words of God from us, you received them not as the words of men, but as what they really are. That is the word of God. And my question as I read that text was this. How did they know? Paul's celebrating in this moment. He says, when we came to you and preached the words of God, you received them as what they really are, the words of God. My question is, how did they know that? What about that presentation made them think, you know, that's not just the thoughts of some philosopher. Those are the very words of the God who created all things. How did they know that? And how can we know that? How can we know that what we really have here aren't just the thoughts of some guy in cold comfort, but really are the communication from the God who fashioned all things? How can we know that? And some people say, well, they knew that because, Ben, they were more primitive in ancient times. And so someone told them the gods have spoken. They go, did they? And uh, it was just easier for them to believe than us modern rational people. But that's not actually true. Paul told the Corinthians, he says, when I preach the gospel to you, it is a foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jew. When Paul preached the words of God, he says it challenged their worldview. And they were like, I don't, um, like people struggled back then. And yet people like the Thessalonians and thousands of people said, but you know what? As I struggle and wrestle with it, I see what we have here really are the words of God. And so our question tonight is, how do we know that? How do you know that you have the words of God? And I'm going to give you some reasons, and we're going to do this a different way. I've done talks like this before where we looked at external evidence like text criticism. How do we know the texts have come to us? We did that, and has the Bible been corrupted? We looked at other external evidence based on the uh, Da Vinci Code and what they brought out in a talk called Has the Bible uh, or the, Where the Books Collide. I'm not really going to do that kind of stuff. What I want to do tonight is really stay in this text and say, what does the Bible say to us? And then in my own personal experience, how did I come to believe? Because for some of you, you're asking the question, how can I trust that what you're telling me really is the thoughts of God? And some of you are asking the question, okay, I believe it, but how did I get there? You're like me and going, why do I believe it's the words of God? And college is the place to ask that question. You go, well, many of you would go, well, because honestly, my mom told me it was. And that's an okay reason for a kid. You know, it really is. But as you get to college, that's not okay. Like, I hate to break this to you, but, but mom could have been wrong, you know? Um, she's top-notch, mom's great, but she could have been off on some things. And so if that's your only reason, you go, okay, uh, I need to know more than that. I think this is the word of God. Why do I think that? And I've got four things I want to share with you, and we'll do them quickly tonight, but four things that come out of the scripture in my personal experience, rather than pulling in all this random data from elsewhere, but I just want to give you four things quickly about how we can know that the message we have here about Jesus Christ, the God-man, really are the very words of God. And there's four factors I'm going to tell you about. And uh, the first one is this. There's a spiritual component. There's a spiritual component to knowing that what we have in the gospel are the words of God. And you see it here when Paul says, we thank God. Paul's thanking God that the Thessalonians believed that the word of God was the word of God. Why is he doing that? Because our belief that what we have here is the word of God at one level is a spiritual issue that God has to show us that these are his words. He enables us to hear. 
And we find out as the scripture presents itself, it says that that is uh, the Holy Spirit of God superintends this process. That God speaks through nature, God has spoken audibly, but Peter will say it at one point, he says, I remember hearing the words of God. He says, we were there and heard the voice from heaven. He'll say in 2 Peter. And he says, and yet we have a more sure word, the prophetic word. And he says, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That he says, what God has done is what Jesus said in John 16, that the spirit of truth led the apostles into all truth. That God's spirit came and led prophets not to speak their own words, but to speak the very words of God and record them. And John 16 says, the spirit of truth led them to truth. And so 2 Timothy 3.16 will say that all scripture is God-breathed. That he breathes through human agents to give us his very thoughts. And what we find out in this text is that the Holy Spirit didn't just inspire the writings that we have in the Old and New Testament, that the Holy Spirit inspired the delivery of this writing to people. Paul will say in 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, he says, our gospel came to you not only in words, but in power in the Holy Spirit. He said, I came to you and it didn't even sound like words. Not only did God inspire the words, he inspired the presentation of them. That when I spoke them to you, it, it landed deeper than just hearing some guy talk. That you realize there's a power to this and the Holy Spirit was empowering the very presentation. And not just the presentation, he was empowering even the understanding. He says in verse 6 of chapter 1, you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit helped you in the reception of this word. He says to the Corinthians that the Spirit who's from God helps us to understand the things freely given by God. So there's a spiritual component. Uh, to understand that we have the words of God is a gift from God. His Spirit leads us to that. And some of you have no problem with that. You say, yeah, Ben, I believe that. Part of why I believe this is the word of God is just because I do, because God got my attention. I was going about my merry way, living life, and God was like, hey, you, words of God. And you're like, oh, thank you. And, uh, and you learned. <laughs> Others of you, that's really disturbing to hear that. You go, what? you're telling me, hey, how do I believe these are the words of God? Because God tells me it's the words of God. Like, that sounds circular. That makes you feel very uncomfortable. Because when I say it's a spiritual component to help you understand that, it, you think spiritual sounds really like seance -y and weird, like kind of like you picture like a spiritual moment where we just kind of play music and you just kind of feel the God vibe. Like you kind of feel God's in this? Just feel it, bro. And it's sort of emotional and vibey and, and you don't trust that. You don't like that. And so some people have a problem with that. You say, okay, you're just telling me you believe it's the word of God because the spirit told you it's the word of God. That's so subjective and weird and that scares me. But let me encourage you with something. Though, God, though Paul will thank God for revealing to them these are the words of God, Paul won't argue that way. Paul did not come to the Thessalonians and say, these are the words of God and I'm just gonna play some music and you guys just feel it, smoke this and then believe it, all right? Like, <laughs> Paul doesn't say that. What Paul says in verse 13 is he says, you received the word which you heard from us. He says, you just believe this. And incidentally, these four points, individually, none of them really fully are convincing, but together they produce a strong argument. It's a spiritual component from God, but it's a spiritual component that has an intellectual component. It has an intellectual component. Then he says, you received the words. I didn't just tell you to feel the vibe. You received what you heard. I spoke words to you. And not only did I tell you these words, Acts 17 tells us about how he told the Thessalonians and listen to the way he did it. It says, and they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews and Paul went in as was his custom and three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. He said, so I came to them and told them there was a man, Jesus, he's the Christ, God's solution to your human problem. He came, lived a perfect life, died because of your sin, rose from the dead and lived. And he says, I explained that to you, but I didn't just tell you that. He says that I reasoned. I gave explanation. I used proofs. So he says, yes, it's a supernatural gift of God to understand these are the words of God, but the means are through the mind. That there is an intellectual component that this is a rational belief system. So Christians aren't meant to just check your brain at the door and just kind of go, you just got to feel it. That's not Christianity. So it's interesting. I read an article today about the Chilean miners, you know, the guys who are stuck right now underground. And there's a big story circulating as people pray for these men that they might be released from, from this cave-in. And the story is about a butterfly. That one of the men, 50 feet 
under the earth's crust was running literally from a cave in and saw a little white butterfly. And stories of that have come up to the surface. And this article was saying, this butterfly, people aren't sure, but then the article sets up a dichotomy. They say, some are saying that the butterfly is a miracle. It's, it's something spiritual God gave them. While other people are saying it's something rational, like there was a butterfly and he got sucked in by convection currents and just landed 50 feet under the earth's crust. All right? And uh, as they talk through this article, they set up this dichotomy. So this butterfly is either something God did, or there's a rational explanation for it. And the article ends with, which do you think it is? Is it spiritual, godly, or is it rational and reasonable? And I'm reading through this and I'm going, the Bible never presents itself this way. The Bible never presents spirituality and rationality at odds. It doesn't. But Paul will commend the Bereans who he went to after the Thessalonians because he came to them and preached and he says they were noble and he calls them noble because they didn't instantly believe Paul. He respected that. That he told them these are the words of God and they're like, um, okay, I don't know, man. And they started doing research and they started thinking and started studying and started analyzing. And he says that search for rational argumentation, there's a nobility to that. And so the Bible's not afraid of rationality. Indeed, that's one of the ways you discover this is the very word of God is you use your mind and you engage this thing. And like I said, there's external proofs that we talked about with textual reliability and different things. I don't wanna go through all that again, but can I tell you a couple things real quick that I think Paul addressed to them that they saw, hey, this, there really is something to this. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says what his gospel presentation was like. And he says, I delivered you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried, raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, the 12, and he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. And Paul says, that's what I presented to people. He said, I presented to them that the life of Christ is in accordance with the scriptures. And by that, he meant the Old Testament. And so when he presented them the argument, he gave them documentation from the Old Testament of prophecies that talked about the life of Jesus. Things like Micah 5.2, written centuries before Jesus, that talked about what city he'd be born in. Or Isaiah 53 or Psalm 22 that give you detail about the nature of his death that came true in A.D. 30. And here, centuries later, they're reading these documents and going, these men, prophets who said, thus saith the Lord, told us about a guy who'd come later, what he'd be like, where he'd move, where he'd sit, who he'd move with, who he'd sit with, how he'd die, and how he'd beat death, and all of that happened, son. And you read through the Bible and you see this isn't just one man who sat down and said, I just think God's talking and I think he's blue. All right? It wasn't one guy. There's over 40 different authors who spoke and there is a radical coherence across centuries. It's remarkable. And what's interesting about that is there are people, um, scholars who came out uh, uh, fairly recently, and they said, well, Ben, yes. What happened was in 300 AD, uh, Constantine took the person of Jesus, and everybody knew he was a man, but in order to consolidate power for the Roman Empire, he said the man Jesus was really God, and so he rewrote all these Bible documents in order to say that Jesus was God, and so he made him fulfill these old prophecies when in reality he didn't. The problem with that is none of the textual evidence supports that thesis at all. But rather, we have even liberal scholars telling us that this letter we're studying together this semester, 1 Thessalonians, was written at the latest A.D. 50, 20 years after the death of Jesus. And what we have in this text is Paul saying Jesus is the Son of God. He said it in chapter 1. And as he presents this Son of God, he doesn't present a myth or a legend because he tells you in this text, hey, the, this thing I'm talking about, he says, many of the people who saw him are still alive. Some of the eyewitnesses have fallen asleep, but some are still here. You can talk to them. Luke was one of his traveling partners, and Luke, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and Luke will say, what I have compiled is a narrative based on eyewitness accounts. That we can trust this intellectually, and let me tell you this real quickly, three reasons. Number one is because what he presents about Jesus came way too early to be a legend. It didn't come 300 years later. Here, within a decade and two decades of Jesus' life, they're talking about Jesus and saying, if you don't believe what I'm saying about this man who died and rose from the dead, go talk to people who saw him. You can't fabricate that. It was too early to be a legend. And the stories we hear about Jesus as you read your Bible are too counterproductive to be legends. They say, well, they wrote them later to kind of make Jesus into this God figure. But the reality was, if you were writing a story about your God hero, you wouldn't put into it the things that we find in the Gospels. 
And you can read old myths and old epics, and their, their heroes are, are amazing, and everybody in it is heroic. But you read the Gospels, and you see Jesus kneeling in the garden and saying, God, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, let it be. That they have Jesus in the garden saying, Lord, I know you want me to save everybody, but if there's any way out of this, I'm totally up for that right now. Why would they put that in there? Or him on the cross saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a scandalous statement, but it's in there. If you were fabricating a story to try to impress people in the ancient world, you know you, what you wouldn't do? You wouldn't make the first eyewitnesses at the cross women. Because in those days, women's testimony was not admissible in court. You'd make it a big handful of dudes. And you read the Gospels, and the first people to see him and testify of his resurrection were women. That would have been counterproductive in that day. I'll tell you what else you wouldn't have done. You wouldn't have taken the leaders of the early church and made them look like morons. But have you read the Gospels lately? I mean, they're always saying dumb things and doing stupid things, and Jesus is like, no. Um, okay, wow. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's run at it again, boys. Everybody sit down. And, uh, and you just see they're buffoons. And I got to tell you something, the gospel presentation that we give is too human to be a legend. And the last thing I'll say about this intellectual part is this, it's too detailed in form, and I'm grateful to Tim Keller and C.S. Lewis for this, that the reality is modern fiction, fictional stories that give great amount of detail, that's an 18th century phenomenon the novel that gives you all kinds of detail. Ancient epics aren't written that way. And the reality is you can go read them. Go read Beowulf. Go read Gilgamesh. They're not written like the Gospels. They certainly don't start like Luke. I have come to give you a, 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 a narrated account based on eyewitnesses. That, that's not how they're written. Uh, and yet in the Gospels, you have something written. I love it. C.S. Lewis said this. He was a professor at Oxford and, and an expert in ancient literature. C.S. Lewis says this. He says, I have been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legends, and myths all my life. I know what they are like. I know none of them are like this. Speaking of the Gospels. And he says, there are only two possible views. Either this is reportage of what really happened, or else some unknown ancient writer without known predecessors or successors suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern novelistic realistic narrative. The reader who does not see this has simply not learned how to read. And that's C.S. Lewis being a professor and being condescending, but you get the idea. <laughs> that the message he presented to them, they're like, I don't think this cat's making this up. He's talking about a guy who lived within a couple years and guys people know, and he's telling these stories in a way no one's told them before. They're historical accounts about a guy who really lived, really died, and really rose. And so I think there's a spiritual component. God opens our eyes that we might see. And there's an intellectual component. He works with our mind. But there's another component too. And I think there's a social component. Notice he said, you heard it from us. There's a social component. That the Thessalonians didn't just hear the message of the gospel of a God man who came to save you. They got to see the messenger. They saw Paul's life. And Paul talked about it, remember, all last week. What kind of man he was. That he had conviction. He says, I believe this so much, I'll take a beating for it and keep going. And they watched him get beat and not stop presenting him. They watched him not take money and keep presenting it. They watched him do things that you go, this guy really believes this. And taking a beating and being willing to die for something doesn't make that thing true. People have died for bad causes all throughout human history. But someone being willing to take a beating and die for something does make you take that message seriously. And so I don't think the social component alone is sufficient to believe these are the words of God. But when you add that Paul was rational in his presentation, that there's a spiritual power to what he was doing, and that you watched his life, and you saw that there's a sincerity to this man. I mean, some of you have seen, and some of you honestly don't believe these are the words of God because of this social component. You can't even hear the message. Why? Because the guy who first presented it to you honestly didn't live it out. And some of you have a resistance to this book that has nothing to do with what's written in these pages. It has everything to do with the fact that your pastor, your youth pastor, some guy who taught these words to you was a hypocrite or used them as a power play. And you're like Brad Pitt, who said in an interview, I went to spiritual stuff all through growing up and it was manipulative and weird and I didn't like the whole social scene, so I got out of it. And his heart is hardened to the gospel because of the social scene of the people who were trying to sell it to him. 
How do you break through that hardness? Some of you, your friends don't want to hear this and it has nothing to do with Jesus. They might actually like him if they ever got to know him. They can't even get to know him because they just hate the people who talk about him. How do you break through that? It's this social component that they see your life. They see you. And so I worked at an oil company one summer and there were people in that company that were very hostile to the things of God. But there was one geologist who loved God and would invite them to Bible study. And I remember there was one little old lady that would mock him, shame him, try to embarrass him about the foolishness of believing this archaic book. And every time she would rail on him and mock him, he would give her a hug and say, I love you. And she's like, oh, get off me. (laughs) And he would take the hit and not hit back. He would take the beating and keep inviting her. And then when she got sick and debilitated, he would care for her and visit her. And she saw a beauty and a conviction and a power in his life that opened her up to believe there might actually be something powerful to this. I got to tell you, for me, after my back surgery, I really needed to get in shape. I was gaining a lot of weight and not in a good way. And so I decided I need a trainer. And let me tell you how I picked a trainer. I went to different gyms and I found trainers that looked in shape. It's not rocket science, right? (laughs) It's surprising how many gyms you see people that aren't. They're training people and you're like, you should maybe buy a little of what you're selling, you know? Uh, But I went to a gym where these people were just stacked, hard, dangerous, kind of scary looking people. And I thought, I'm going to do that. And I got to tell you, I go for them. Why? Because I go, whatever it is you're selling, you've bought it and it's working. And so when I watch your life, I go, that is so attractive. What's getting you that? Creatine, protein, what are you doing? What are you eating these days? All right, and, uh, and I'm open to what you have to say because I've watched you. And I gotta tell you something, there's a social component. Christian, as the non-believer watches you, their heart will either become softer to this or harder to this based on your social component. And some of you came to Christ in college and you're wondering how to share Christ with your parents. Can I tell you something? You don't do it by going home with this book and saying, mom, dad, thanks for raising me the last 20 years, but you guys are hellbound and confused. And let me tell you, you need to repent. Let me tell you something. That's not gonna fly. And they're gonna come to you and go, who are you don't know me? I wiped your, you know, I mean, they're not gonna buy it. How do you open up your non-believing parents to the words of God? I'll tell you how. You go home and you do the dishes. And you go home and you straighten up the house without asking. And you go home and you know what they're going to ask before they even ask it. You anticipate their needs and meet them. I promise if you go home and do that, just live like that, they're going to look and go, surely there is a God in College Station. All right? And uh, (laughs) and they're going to say, what is happening to you? And part of why these people believed these are the words of God is because they saw the people of God and they said, whatever happened to you, I want to know what it is and I want to know more about it. So there's a social component. And the last component is this, very quickly. There's an affective component. Affective. And by that I mean mood, emotion, the heart. It gets to the heart. He says, you receive this not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. This book goes to work in you. And it does it in a lot of different ways, but Hebrews 4 will say this. This word of God is living and alive, active active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit, both joint and marrow, and it is able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It says this book is alive, and this book is at work in you. And the writer of Hebrews says what it does is it gets into you and it knows you. You hear the words of God and it cuts through the intentions of the heart and it gets to you and it resounds with the human heart. That's, that's how you believe this is the word of God. You begin to read through it and go, there's something here deeper than any other sophistry I've heard anywhere else. And it resonates deep in me. It fits with what I know of how the world works that it's so beautifully designed, someone had to design this. It fits with how people work, that there's something beautiful and glorious about us. It fits with our humanity, that there's something deeply broken in us. And this tells us, oh yeah, there is. 
And it tells you this deep brokenness you can't get out by yourself. And many of us know that. And you've gone through self-help books and everything else, and you're like Lady Macbeth who's screaming out, damned spot out, and you can't get rid of the stain. That there's something broken in us, and though we're glorious in the image of God, we are broken and we can't fix us. We can't rub the stain out. And in all of our hearts, there's a longing for a hero. Every movie and book we read resonates with the story of a rescuer. And you read this and you say, that's because God sent one. All our little stories we pay five bucks at the movie theater to watch are little echoes of the one true story, that there is a hero who came to get us. And he is morally beautiful. And he was gracious with broken people and he was scathing to hypocrites and arrogant people. He was full of grace, and he was full of truth, and he presented to the world the perfections that we long for a human being to have. They are filled in Jesus. And you see a perfect life, and you see a willing sacrifice to die for what we know we're guilty of, and his penalty paid for our guilt, and he rose from the dead, and he gives us victory beyond the grave. We know this life isn't it. We know it. And the Bible tells us it's not. And yet our only rescue before a holy God is the God-man, Jesus Christ. And you read that in deep calls to deep. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, if you walked up to a piano and saw sheet music and then saw a little sheet of music on the ground, how would you know that that sheet on the ground fits into the song you see in front of you? He said you would pick that sheet up off the ground and place it in among the others, and you would just play. And if those notes sync up with the other notes and they all play together, you know it's part of that song. How did I finally come to believe these are the words of God? I think God let me. It's a spiritual miracle. I wrestled with it intellectually as a freshman and a sophomore in college. Socially, I knew some people who lived it out and they helped me. And then it resonated with my heart because as I looked around at the world and I looked down at what this book says about where we came from, what's wrong with us, how it's dealt with and where we're going, I said, this music plays. It answers my big questions. It plays. And so I hope you'll come to embrace that and embrace that these are the very words of God to us. And I'll just say this as we close. There was a, you know, the, the Russians were the first people to put a man into space. And the Russian cosmonaut who came back <clears throat> came and did a press conference. And he said this, you know, it was back in communism, atheistic culture. And he said, I arose to the heavens and I noticed when I was up there, there was no God there. And it was just kind of this smug little, ha ha. I've been to the heavens and your God's not there. And this was back in the 1940s, and C.S. Lewis wrote a response. And C.S. Lewis said this, you're making a category mistake. To say you went up to the heavens and God was not there is like Hamlet going up to his attic looking for Shakespeare. <laughs> you're not going to find him within that which he has made. And yet he posed the question to us, and I'll pose it to you. How could Hamlet ever meet Shakespeare? How could Hamlet meet Shakespeare? There's only one way. If Shakespeare writes himself into the play, and that's what we have. Jesus is called the Word of God, the expression of God, because God wrote himself into the play, and God became a man to come get you, and he inspired men to faithfully record the story so that you might know him and come to find life in the God-man, Jesus Christ. And I pray you will. And I pray as you read this word, you'll cherish it, and it changes you.